Good evening. Welcome to Addis. My name is Rabbi Lauren Holtzblatt. This is Rabbi Ale Ar What's your name? <laughs> this is Rabbi Aaron Alexander. Um, and we're just absolutely thrilled to have you here tonight. Uh, at Addis Israel, we primarily measure our increasing growth, not by how many people walk through the doors, but by the capacity and the openness of our hearts. Our hearts, this community's heart, has four chambers, four core practices which obligate us. We are chesed, loving kindness, in which we take care of each other at any and every stage of life. We are tzedek, justice, in which we are obligated to redefine the very we of who is in this world. These walls, they may protect us, but mostly they are meant to come down so that there can be all of us. We are tefillah, prayer. We pray like our life depends on it, and we live and work fiercely as if our prayers don't matter. And lastly, we are really mood. We are sacred text. We never stop plumbing their depths for the ancient wisdom that continues to animate all of it. You don't have to be a member to join us. Just come. Come during the week, come on Shabbat, come on a Sunday, come join us for meditation, for prayer, for Torah, for Torah study, just to come and have a conversation, a cup of coffee. We actually have good coffee in the building, believe it or not. So uh, you came here tonight for, um, I will say, Justice Ginsburg is a hero. She is an absolute hero. I could not think, we could not think of um, someone to be with us at this particular time that we're experiencing in our country. It's a dark moment, and um, she represents everything that we want to be fighting for, for those that are marginalized, for a woman's voice in the public sphere, in the justice system, for equity, for equality, um, for everything that we hold dear. And so for the second time, it's an embarrassment of riches. For the second time, we welcome her tonight to this bima, and we relinquish it out of total love and deep, deep respect for who she is and what she brings into the world. I'd like to introduce Kathleen Paradis, who sits on the board of the Forward, who herself is a remarkable human being, an incredible, an incredible lawyer who has been fighting for equity and women's rights for over 30 years. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, um, I guess you've been welcomed. Uh, I just want to say a word about the forward and what uh, uh, 120 years of fearless, progressive, workplace fairness advocating journalism uh, the forward has been for the last 120 years and counting. Uh, the Forward is a mainstay of the progressive Jewish community, and we're here to celebrate that. I want to give a shout out to Rachel Fishman Federson. Where are you standing, Rachel? There she is. Can you stand up for a minute? Rachel is the publisher of The Forward. Jane Eisner is the editor. You're going to see her in a minute. Uh, the uh, head of the Yiddish Forward is a woman. This is a woman led organization. And. If you've ever heard an argument in the United States Supreme Court, you know that too is a woman-led organization. <laughs> so I'd like to ask Ruth Ginsburg and Jane Eisner to come out before I actually say a few words about them. but please be seated. I could say an awful lot about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I had a lot of alternative plans, 
But yesterday, there was a prayer for Ruth published in Lilith. Did you happen to read it? You've been traveling. It was written by Abby Pogrebin. It's very short, and I'd like to read it. At a time as disquieting as this, when so many of us feel deflated, shaken, worried for the future, when we almost can't remember what it's like to go a day without name-calling, without lies, harshness, or callousness, when we're nostalgic for those halcyon years of complete sentences, dignified statesmanship, <laughs> acts of empathy. We still look to you, Ruth, Gator, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, yeshiva girl turned legendary justice, RBG icon, fighter for the powerless and wronged. May you go from strength to strength because you have been ours. May you live many more years because you make the world brighter, fairer, kinder. Because we need you. You've helped us remain clear, not just on the foundational principles of a nation, but on our Jewish mandate to welcome the stranger and never stand idly by. The Hebrew words on your office wall in calligraphy read, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, Justice, Justice, shall thou pursue. And you're certainly a justice who is pursued. <laughs> you have and will keep trying. God bless Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And welcome Jane Eisner, the intrepid editor of The Forward, my friend, my icon, and I'm happy to welcome both of you. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank you to everyone coming here to Addis Israel. To those of you who are watching this at Ford.com and on Facebook, we welcome you. It is such a thrill and a pleasure for me and on behalf of all of my colleagues to um, participate in such an important event. In the last few weeks, we've asked forward readers to send us their questions for Justice Ginsburg, and the response has been overwhelming. We heard from readers all across the country and, and from overseas as well. Tonight, I will quote from some of these questions in our conversation because they are brilliant and funny, and they're a powerful reflection of how interested Americans truly are in the United States Supreme Court, and especially in this United States Supreme Court justice. I do want to say at the outset that Justice Ginsburg has asked that we not discuss issues that are before the court or may be before the court. And of course, we're respecting that. Happily, there are so many other topics to talk about. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg, many readers of ours are interested in your Jewish life and identity and how it shaped your, your judicial career and your outlook. And as we sit in this beautiful sanctuary, this seems like a very good place to start. You grew up in Brooklyn from a family, okay, let's hear it for Brooklyn. <laughs> a family that was not devout, but very identified. You have described your mother, your beloved mother lighting candles on Friday nights. And I heard how, I've heard how you've enjoyed celebrating Passover with your family. You've remarked that the four questions was the best part of the Seder. I'm wondering why. A child, the youngest child, is asking about this evening in this celebration, why is Passover night different from all other nights? It's a child asking a question, and the rest of the, uh, the Seder is devoted to answering that mm -hmm. child's question. I think it's just one of many illustrations of how Jews, Jews are learning and want children to be well educated. A, a couple of years ago with Rabbi Holtzblatt, you wrote about the heroic and visionary women 
in the Passover story. And I'm just wondering, did you notice all that when you were a girl? Or is that the kind of thing that emerged later in life for you, this recognition of the role of women in this well, story? Lauren was the prime mover in this venture. I think growing up, I might have known about Miriam and Moses' mother, but I didn't know about the midwives, and I didn't. Well, I knew about the Pharaoh's Pharaoh's daughter, but the Passover Seder, the Haggadah, uh, there were no women in it. That's true. And so you've worked to make a difference in that regard. Um, and I th and I understand that that was something that you were aware of as a girl as well. Your limitations. The boys were having bar mitzvahs, and girls could not. Uh, and your mother had very strict Orthodox upbringing. And I'm just wondering how that experience of being a girl uh, at a time when girls and women had very little or no role in religious life, how did that affect you? Did it inspire you, or, or, or was it something that you wanted to change? Of course I wanted to change it. I wanted to have a big party for Mitzvah <laughs> and get all those presents that I grew up with a, a cousin. We lived in the same household. Two sisters married, two brothers. We were three months apart. We were like twins. And he was Bar Mitzvah and had this great party and all the gifts. I was very jealous. <laughs> Well, later on in life, um, I've read that you traced the Jewish presence on the Supreme Court, beginning not with Justice Louis Brandeis, the first justice, but actually with Judah Benjamin, who was the first Jew to be offered a seat yes. in the United States Supreme Court, but who declined. And in fact, he became a leader of the Confederacy. And I'm wondering, why do you start there in thinking about the Jewish presence on the court? I don't think of Benjamin as present on the court. Jews come in all sizes and shapes, and some are very good and some are not so good. <laughs> um, Benjamin was a very interesting character. He did have an Orthodox Jewish upbringing, mm -hmm. but he married out of the faith. Um, his, his story is intriguing. He, he rose to the top of the ranks in the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason he turned down the Supreme Court appointment was he had just been chosen by the Louisiana legislature to be Louisiana's senator. These are days before the 17th Amendment, so senators were chosen by the state legislature, not by direct vote. Mm -hmm. And he thought, all things considered, being a senator was a better job for him. <laughs> he, he might have envisioned that if he'd been on the court, it wouldn't be too many years before he had to resign. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we have a question oh, from- Oh, I just wanted to say something more Please. about it. Although he was a, a leader of the Confederacy, he was a slaveholder, he was subject to virulent anti-Semitism yes. by others high in the ranks of the Confederacy. They referred to him as Judas Iscariot. Wow. It's true, and I know uh, recently we ran a story about uh, Confederate monuments because there was so much controversy about them, and there's actually no monument to him, even though he was a leader of the Confederacy. And it may be just because of what you said, of, of the way he was treated among the other Confederate <coughs> leaders. They do have uh, some considerable uh, um, exhibition about Benjamin in, in the museum in New Orleans. And have you seen it? Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow. We have a question from My Michael Rosenzweig, uh, a reader in Georgia. He wondered how your Jewishness has affected your life's work as a lawyer, a law professor, a feminist, and a Supreme Court justice. Perhaps I should start by saying I grew up in the shadow of World War II, and we 
came to know more and more what was happening to the Jews in, mm -hmm. in Europe. The sense of being an outsider, of being one of the people who, who had suffered oppression for no, no sensible reason. I, it's, it's the sense of being part of a minority. It makes you more empathetic to other people who are not insiders, who are outsiders. I would say that, and a love of learning, the sense of being a member of a minority group that somehow has survived generations and generations of hatred and plundering. But the idea, I could think of my, my own family. My father came from Russia when he was 13. He never went to school in any country. He went to a header in, in his shuttle in, in uh, outside Odessa. But, and my mother was the first person in her large family born in the USA. She was born four months after her mother arrived here, so she was conceived in the old world, born in the mm -hmm. new world. Oh. And both of them, more than anything else, wanted me to have a good education. That was mm -hmm. a number one on their list of what I should have. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned growing up in the shadow of World War II and the Holocaust. And, and I'm wondering if that shaped your views of human rights and human rights law. It's certainly a large part of it. Um, I think you probably know that the, the Holocaust was the beginning of the end of apartheid in America. We were fighting a war against odious racism, and our own troops in that war until the very end were rigidly separated by race. So when we were fighting a war against racism, how long could segregation in our own country mm -hmm. persist? So I consider World War II one of the major propelling forces to the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Hmm. So you see a connection between that and then what especially many of those African American soldiers faced coming back to the states after they had fought and then came back as essentially second class citizens. Yes. Hmm, that's so interesting. And you feel secure now as a Jew, I, I sense. Um, the beautiful poem that we heard referenced the artwork that's on, uh, on the walls of your chamber, and there's a mezuzah on the door. And I'm just wondering, in your time on the court, how has it accommodated Jewish tradition, and has that changed while you've been there? There hadn't been a Jewish justice for some years, from Abe Fortas until my appointment. The clerk of the Supreme Court, and Clerk Souter, came to see me very early on in my tenure. And he said, I'm very glad you're here because you can help me with a problem. The Supreme Court admits lawyers to membership in the Supreme Court bar. And every year they would get, oh, a half a dozen or more complaints from Orthodox Jews who said, we're so proud of our membership in the Supreme Court bar, but we can't frame our certificate and put it on the wall because it said, in the year of our Lord, so and so, and he's not our Lord. So I spoke to the chief about this, he said, We'll take it up at conference. <laughs> and one of my colleagues, whose name I will not disclose, 
<laughs> said, in the year of our Lord was good enough for Brandeis, it was good enough for Cardozo, it was good enough for Frankfurter, it was good enough even for Goldberg. And before he got to Fortis, I said, it's not good enough for Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it took a while for, it, for the cycle to complete. Because first they said, all right, for the Orthodox Jews, we'll have just in a year so and so. And then there were some complaints. Uh, we liked what it said on the certificate about of the, of the independence of the United States. So please keep that on our certificate. <laughs> now, if you want a certificate, uh, showing your membership in the Supreme Court bar, you have your choice. You can have just the year 2018 or the, and the year of our Lord so-and-so or the independence of the United States. It's the way it should be. It's your choice, what you want it to be. Wow. And, and then the, the next was the great Yom Kippur controversy. Usually the High Holy Days come out before the court starts mm -hmm. up, but sometimes they overlap. So the, Justice Breyer and I, Justice Kagan was not yet on the court, uh, asked the chief if the court could defer the sitting day. And first response was, we confer on Good Friday, and nobody complains about that. I said, I'd be happy to come Thursday that week. Uh, then I think the, the argument that was utterly convincing for the chief was that inevitably in an argument session, there will be Jewish lawyers. And do you want to put them, <laughs> and they, they have, this is their day at the Supreme Court. They've worked so hard on this case. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take away from them the opportunity to present their case and require them to have a substitute? And that, and that resonated. And so now we don't sit on the high holy days. Wow. So one of our readers, Jesse Lempel of Cambridge, Massachusetts, had a really interesting question. Um, he noted that you once described an opinion by Israeli Justice Aharon Barak that uh, forbid torture, even in what they call the ticking time bomb situations. And you said that you thought that opinion had tremendous persuasive value. So I'm wondering, as an American Jewish jurist, do you feel any special affinity with the work of the Israeli Supreme Court? I feel a special affinity to the work of Aharon Barak. He's one of the most brilliant jurists mm -hmm. of our time. As you know, Israel doesn't have a constitution. Right. But they have five basic laws. And they, uh, the Israeli Supreme Court has a wealth of law to draw on. They have Ottoman Empire law. They have the heritage from the United Kingdom. They have Jewish law. The, the case that you mentioned, the so-called ticking bomb case, presented to the Israeli Supreme Court this question. The police have apprehended a suspect they believe to know when and where a bomb is going off. Can we use extreme means, a euphemism for torture, to extract that information? And in a very eloquent judgment, written by then president of the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, Barak, the answer was clear, torture, never. And the opinion explained that there's no greater gift we can give to our enemy than to become so overwhelmed by our concern for security 
that more and more we come to resemble our enemy in our disrespect for human rights. Mm. I wonder if we can um, turn to your personal history for a moment. Um, your sister, your only sibling, died when she was six and you were less than two years old. Your beloved mother was stricken with cancer during your first year in high school and just sadly died two days before your graduation. I I'm just wondering how this affected your ex uh, sense of wanting to support women and girls. And, and in particular, I understand how much of an inspiration your mother was. I'm wondering if you want to t tell us a little bit about that. My mother was a hugely intelligent woman. She emphasized two things. One was that I should be a lady, and by that, she didn't mean fancy dress. What she meant is be in control of your emotions and don't give way to anger, and to remorse, to envy. Those emotions just sap strength and don't enable you to move forward. And her other message was be independent. I suppose she hoped that someday I would meet and marry Prince Charming. <laughs> but nevertheless, she uh, emphasized the importance of, of being able to fend for, my, for myself. Mm -hmm. Well, and you did marry your Prince Charming, right? Uh, Marty Ginsburg, your long, long time partner. But early on in your marriage, there was more adversity. He was stricken, uh, very sick with cancer. You yourself has, have battled it twice. And as one of our readers asked, I'm wondering how do you keep going under such challenging circumstances? Where do you draw your strength? I, th I think the hardest time was when Marty had a, a testicular cancer. There was no chemotherapy, there was massive surgery and daily radiation. But we always, we, we got through each day mm -hmm. and were thankful that we had. And we never thought anything other than that he would live as he did. And I was similarly inspired when I had pancreatic cancer by Marilyn Horn, who is a great mezzo. And when she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, that was her attitude, I will live. And she is still very much alive. Wow, that is amazing. I'd like to turn now to your long and admirable championing of gender equality. I know that you have discussed uh, those early cases in the public before, but I wonder if you might share with our audience tonight just one of your favorite cases, one of the things that you think had the most impact early on in this new field. Well, before I answer that question, I brought along with me uh, one of the, there was not too much to inspire young women in my days. There was Nancy Drew, and that was just about <laughs> it. But it's not in this way. I read something by a very young woman. She was barely 15 when she wrote it. And if I can find it here, I'd like to read it to you. Um, let's see. So as I said, these are the words of a young woman just turning 15. One of the many questions I have of, that has often bothered me 
is why women have been, and still are, thought to be so inferior to men. It's easy to say it's unfair, but that's not good enough for me. I'd like to know the reason for this great injustice. Men presumably dominated women from the very beginning because of their greater physical strength. It's men who earn a living, beget children, and do as they please. Until recently, women silently went along with this, which was stupid. <laughs> Since the longer it's kept up, the more deeply entrenched it becomes. Fortunately, education, work, and progress have opened women's eyes. In many countries, they've been granted equal rights. Many people, mainly women, but also men, now realize how wrong it was to tolerate this state of affairs for so long. The letter is signed, yours, N. M. Frank. It was one of the last entries made in her diary I think this audience knows she was born in the Netherlands in 1929, and she died in 1945 while imprisoned at Bergen-Belsen, just three months short of her 16th birthday. Isn't that amazing that a child would write such a thing? It really is. I, you know, it's, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think we overlook that aspect of um, of her writing in her diary. Wow, thank you. Well, a, a so lot of... You asked about the gender discrimination litigation. Yes. To, to pick a favor is a little like asking me which of my four grandchildren and two step-grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> but I think to illustrate the arbitrariness of gender-based discrimination, Stephen Weisenfeld's case is as good as any other. And this was Stephen Weisenfeld's story. He was um, married to a, a woman who taught in a public high school. She earned a little more money than he did. She had a healthy pregnancy. She taught into the ninth month. At the hospital, the doctor came out and told Stephen, you have a healthy baby boy, but your wife died of an embolism. As Stephen Weisenfeld decided at that moment that he would personally care for his infant, that he would not work full time until the child was in school full time. So he had heard about something called child in care benefits um, that Social Security afforded. He went down to the local Social Security office and he said, I'd like to apply for child in care benefits. The benefits were arranged so that you could earn up to a certain amount and still get the benefits. Once you went above that amount, your benefit was reduced dollar for dollar. But Stephen thought that with the Social Security benefits and his part-time earning, he could just about make it. He was told by the attendant at the Social Security office, these are mother's benefits. They're not available to fathers. So we're in the early 70s now. And Stephen Weisenfeld writes a letter to the editor of his local Edison, New Jersey newspaper. It goes like this. I hear a lot these days about women's lib. Let me tell you my story. And then he recites what happened at the Social Security office. And his tagline was, does Gloria Steinem know about this? <laughs> well. I was teaching at Rutgers at the time. A, a woman who taught on the Spanish faculty lived in the same town, read the letter, called Stephen Weisenfeld and suggested that he contact 
the New Jersey affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union. And that's how his case began. The court issued a unanimous judgment, but they divided three ways in the rationale. So most of them, led by Justice Brennan, said this is a typical case of the discrimination women encountered. Paula Weisenfeld paid the same Social Security taxes as a man would pay, but her taxes didn't net her family the same benefits that a man's did. And then a few of them thought, this is discrimination against male as parent, because the law tells him, you have no choice. You have to be a full-time earner. You have to hire a substitute for yourself to take care of your child. And then one, who later became my chief, then Justice Rehnquist said, it's totally arbitrary from the point of view of the baby. Why should the baby have the opportunity for care of a sole surviving parent of when the parent who died is male, but not when she is female? So it, everybody was hurt by this uh, arbitrary gender-based discrimination. The woman is wage earner, the male is parent, and the baby. There, there's a lovely metaphor in that, actually, because it seems that... Okay. Hello? We need technical assistance. <laughs> Is, is it coming across now? Okay. Yes, now? And we'll get one for Justice Ginsburg if we needed to. <laughs> I was just saying, I feel like there's a lovely metaphor in, um, in that sort of triumvirate of answers in that it shows that gender equality is actually for men and for women and for children. Did you see it that way? In very much so, and that's how we argued it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, around that time, in 1973, you delivered a full-throated support for the Equal Rights Amendment, which at that time had passed both houses of Congress but was never ratified by enough states to become part of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, do we need an ERA now, especially in this Me Too moment? First, I should say that our Constitution is powerfully hard to amend. After Congress, it takes three, quarter, three quarters of the states to ratify, yes. and the ERA fell three states short. People ask me a question like the one you asked. Haven't, haven't women progressed under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause to get you to the point where you would be if there were an Equal Rights Amendment? And my answer is perhaps but then I take out my pocket constitution and say, I have three granddaughters. I can show this constitution, our fundamental of in instrument of government, and point to the First Amendment guaranteeing freedom of speech, press, religion. I would like them to see in the constitution a statement that men and women are persons of equal citizenship stature. That I'd like to see that as a basic tenet of our system. Every constitution in the world written since the year 1950 has an equivalent of an equal rights amendment, a statement that men and women are persons equal in dignity and in rights. Our Constitution starts out, we the people, 
in order to form a more perfect union. And I think part of becoming, a very large part of becoming a more perfect union is to embrace more and more people. Think of how it was in the beginning, in 1787 when the original Constitution was written. So who are we, the people? I would not have been there. Half the population would not have been there. The people who were held in human bondage, Native Americans were not part of the political constituency. But over now, well, well over two centuries, I think the genius of the Constitution is, is that this concept of we the people has become ever more embracing. And so I would like to see an equal rights amendment in our Constitution so that the And I'm still hopeful that there's some movement in Congress to revive the amendment. You have spoken recently about your own Me Too moment, which happened years ago. And one of our readers wondered whether you still experience sexism today. Not that kind of sexism. I'm, the, <laughs> I'm soon going to be 85. So. Um, but is, is there lingering um, bias? I think in the decade of the 70s, most of the explicit gender-based classification were gone. A combination of legislatures changing, courts issuing decisions. It was a conversation between the mm -hmm. courts and the legislature to accomplish that change, getting rid of almost all of the explicit gender-based lines. What's left is what has been called unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And my best example of that is the symphony orchestra. When I was growing up, I never saw a woman in the symphony orchestra, except perhaps the harpist. Howard Taubman, who is a well-known music critic for the New York Times, swore that he could tell whether it's a woman playing or a man, the piano, the violin. One day, someone decided to put him to the test. So they sat him down, they blindfolded him, then they had a procession of young artists come out and perform. And he was all mixed up. He got it all, <laughs> all wrong. So then, someone came up with the brilliant idea, let's drop a curtain so that the judges of the competition would not see the people who were auditioning. Mm -hmm. And with that, almost overnight, there was a change in the composition of, of symphony orchestras. A young violinist, when I told this story at a music festival some years ago, said, well, you left out something. What, what, what did I leave out? You left out that we audition shoeless so they won't hear women's heels coming. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we can't replicate the, the dropped curtain in every mm. area of endeavor. It, there's a wonderful slim volume. It's two lectures by Mary Beard, which she the first one is about women's voicelessness, and the second is women in power. But she starts with the story of a Penelope coming down to where the suitors are, and Telemachus, her son, telling her, Mother, you're not supposed to speak in public. Women don't speak in, in public. This is in Homer's Odyssey. Yes. Uh, I don't know how many times I attended meetings as a young faculty member and where I would say something and there was silence and the discussion went on. And then maybe 10, 15 minutes later, a man would say just what I had said. 
and there would be a reaction, good idea. <laughs> there was a tendency to tune out when a woman was speaking because you couldn't expect her to say anything worthwhile. Well, in fact, this condition really might be continuing. I found a study in 2015 of the women Supreme Court justices, so that would be you and Justices Kagan and Sotomayor, that you were interrupted three times more often than your male colleagues. Now, this was an academic study. Does that ring true to you? Does it, does it mean anything? I think the academic study is accurate if you look at, look at the transcripts. I'm glad that that report came out because I think things will change. I think <laughs> <laughs> men will be more conscious that this is happening. Uh, on the other side, I can't say that we have been so good about not interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when, when Justice Scalia was alive, it was a competition between Sotomayor and Scalia to see who could ask the most questions at an oral <laughs> argument. So many of oh, our... Oh, let me tell you another, another yes. thing. Because it, 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 it's, it's a very Jewish story. So <laughs> one day in an argument session, Justice O'Connor was asking a question. And then I jumped in and she said, just a minute, I'm not finished. Next day in the USA Today headline, Rude Ruth Interrupts Sandra. <laughs> Uh, at lunch, immediately after the argument, I apologized to Cindy. He said, Ruth, don't worry about it at all. The guys do it to each other all the time. <laughs> so when I was asked my reaction to this article, that's what my response was. The reporter who wrote the story watched for the next two argument sessions, and she said, you know, she's right, but I never noticed it when the men are interrupting <laughs> each other. Then a woman came to my rescue from um, Georgetown, a great expert in language, and she tried to explain how, how, how was it that I came to interrupt Sandra. Well, just as Sandra Day O'Connor is from a, a ranch on the border between New Mexico and Arizona, a laid back gal from the <laughs> from the West. And I am a fast-talking Jewish girl <laughs> from New York. <laughs> well, people who know the two of us know that Sandra got out two words for my every one. <laughs> but that was the, the stereotypical, meant well, but Ill illustration. Of it. <laughs> Jews are fast-talking, accustomed to interrupting each other. <laughs> So many of our readers, men and especially women, are really hungry for your advice. Um, here's Becky from Raleigh, North Carolina. She says she's been working as a paralegal for only a few months and has already faced discrimination. She wants to pursue her dream of a legal career. What advice would you give her? And first, find, find allies. Being a loner is hard, but if you have other people with you, that buoys up your own confidence and your spirit. And don't respond to an insult that you have experienced by saying, you sexist pig. <laughs> you, you, I thought that my job in the early 70s was to be a kind of a kindergarten teacher, to explain to judges that there really was such a thing as gender-based discrimination. It was a big difference between their understanding of racial discrimination and gender discrimination. Racial discrimination was odious, but discrimination between men and women, the myth was that it always operates benignly in the woman's favor. Mm -hmm. So 
to tell a man who thinks he's been a very good husband and a very good father that he is a discriminator. It, it takes an education for them to see mm -hmm. that there really is such a thing. Mm -hmm. Because every time the Supreme Court met up with a gender-based classification before 1971, it rationalized it as a favor to women. Women weren't put on the jury rolls. Well, that's a favor. Uh, they mustn't be distracted from their work as the center of home and family mm -hmm. life. Never mind that it has something to say about women's citizenship. Citizens have obligations as well as rights. One obligation is to participate in the justice system. Men are obliged to serve, but women are expendable. Uh, or the notion that one typical law passed by the state of Michigan in the 1940s. A woman could not serve as bartender unless her husband or her father owned the establishment. <laughs> the, the testing case was the mother who owned a tavern and her daughter was her bartender. The Supreme Court dispatched that as legislation meant to protect the woman from unsavory places. Never mind that there was no restriction on the woman being a barmaid, that is the one who carried the drinks to the table. <laughs> she didn't stand behind a bar to protect her. Well, that was in 1948, but that was the thinking that these classifications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It took a while for judges to understand what Justice Brennan said so well this pedestal that women are supposed to stand on, more often than not, turns out to be a cage. So that, that was our mission, to get judges to understand mm -hmm. that there really was such a thing as gender-based discrimination. So one of the, the justice that it seems you've had over the years, the warmest and most unusual relationship is the late Justice Antonin Scalia. And there are many people who marvel at the fact that the two of you disagreed so vehemently and yet had such a warm and deep relationship. And several of our readers asked about this. Um, a teacher wrote in and said her public policy students say they, they can't talk to their peers whose political views differ from their own. Another reader says it's so hard to talk to family members these days and friends who don't agree with them. And so I'm wondering, how did you and Justice Scalia do it? The first time I met Justice Scalia. He was then Professor Scalia, teaching at the University of Chicago. I attended a lecture he gave. I disagreed with a lot of what he said, <laughs> but I was totally captivated by the way he said it. He is a, a man, was a man with a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. When we became buddies on the DC circuit, where the court sits in panels of three judges, and he would whisper something to me in the middle of an oral argument. It would totally crack me up. <laughs> and I had all I could do to avoid bursting out in hilarious <laughs> laughter. Uh, we had shared certain things. Well, one is he was brought up in Queens. I was brought up in Brooklyn in roughly similar neighborhoods where um, people were either Irish or Italian or Jewish. We both really cared about families. And we had an annual New Year's party where, uh, where the fair would be whatever Nino hunted. So usually it was Bambi. And my husband, who was a great chef, made venison. And whatever children uh, were around came. And then we shared a love of opera. In fact, there is an opera was a comic opera called Scalia Ginsburg. 
And I think it does a wonderful job of explaining our friendship. It starts out with Scalia's rage aria. And the rage aria is, is typical Handelian in style. It goes like this. The justices are blind. How can they possibly spout this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. And then uh, I respond that he is searching for bright line solutions to problems that don't have easy answers. But the great thing about our Constitution is that, like our society, it can evolve. Well, then Scalia gets locked up in a dark room. He's being punished for excessive dissenting. <laughs> and he has to go through certain tests to get out. So I enter through a glass ceiling, and I, <laughs> I, tell, I, I tell a character left over from Don Giovanni, who's in this, in Scalia Ginsburg, who's called the Commentatore. And he is astonished. He said, why would you want to help him? He's your enemy. And then we sing a wonderful duet. <laughs> I, I say, he's not my enemy, he's my dear friend. Yes, we are different, but we are one. Different in the way we approach interpretation of legal texts, but one in our reverence for the Constitution and for the institution we serve. We recently had excerpts from the opera Scalia Ginsburg at the Library of Congress. The audience were members and staff of the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. <laughs> what did they think of it? Well, the next day, Senator Grassley asked if he could have a copy of my remarks. <laughs> <laughs> but that, um, Sometimes I would speak to Justice Scalia in private and say, this is so over the top what you have written. Is to say, tone it down, it'll be more persuasive. Mm -hmm. He never took that advice. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, he would come into my chambers. And Scalia was <clears throat> a great grammarian, his father, was a, was a Latin teacher at Brooklyn College. His mother had been a grade school teacher. So if I made a grammatical error, he would let me know. He'd either call or come into chambers. He never sent a message. He never sent, sent a memo around so that I could be embarrassed at the mm. mistakes I made. Do you think that there are lessons in your friendship now. We're in such a polarized time. And I think people really are thirsty for role models that are able to transcend, transcend their philosophical or political or judicial differences. Is there any lesson in your friendship for us? Well, I think it is our caring about the welfare, the good and welfare of the court. And anybody who's in a decision-making body, that should be number one priority. I would say that the Supreme Court is the most collegial place I've ever worked. Really? Beyond any law faculty, mm -hmm. beyond the D.C. Circuit. Now, we all respect, and in most cases, genuinely like each other. <laughs> and I probably can ask you to Describe. <laughs> but let me tell you the way it was in the not so good old days. Think of Justice Brandeis coming on the court. He is the second Wilson appointee. The first was Justice McReynolds. Justice McReynolds was an out and out anti Semite. Mm -hmm. And when Brandeis, this brilliant man who was sometimes called Isaiah, when Brandeis got up to speak at conference, McReynolds would leave the room. Really? Wow. Did anyone object? Did anyone say this is wrong? I guess in time he overcame 
uh, his difficulties. Wow. So you had a very warm and loving and quite unusual partnership with your late husband, Marty. Um, I understand that he was much more socially gregarious than you were yeah. for many years. He was a great cook uh, and a rock hunter. And it does seem that since his passing, your public persona has grown. And I'm wondering if that's a coincidence or whether there's some connection there. Marty was my biggest booster all my life. Um, we, were, we were married when the, the same month I graduated from college. Marty had his first year of law school. He was then taken out at the tail end of the Korean War for service. So when he, we went back, he was in his second year. I was in my first year. And one of his classmates, <coughs> I said, someone I had known in Cornell said to me, you know, your husband, he's bragging about you. He's saying you're going to be on the law review. And I looked at you, and you were this little twerp person. <laughs> um, but that's the way Marty was. He always yeah. made me feel that I was better than I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> but it, which was extraordinary for a young man in, in the 50s. You know, I went to a school, Cornell University, with a ratio, four men to every woman. It was the ideal place for parents of a daughter. <laughs> if you could not find your man at Cornell, you were hopeless. <laughs> if I, 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 what made Marty so it's just overwhelmingly attractive to me is that he cared that I had a brain. Mm. And not met a guy before who was interested at all. Mm -hmm. And I, some of my classmates at Cornell, very bright women, they would play dumb. Just, and that was the way to please a man, to make him feel more mm -hmm. important. But Marty was so secure in his own ability and that he never regarded me as any kind of a threat, far from it. I think his idea was, if I decided I wanted to spend the rest of my life with Ruth, she's got to be something special. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's rather hard to imagine you playing dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that. Um, so you're a rather famous person now, you know. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, here you have your own swag, and there's, <laughs> there's mugs, and, and, and you have your, your tote bag, your I descent tote bag. And, you know, it, is it strange to see your, your face on mugs and tote bags? <laughs> well, this is all the creation of a second year law student at mm -hmm. NYU. Shanna Knizny. And it started when the Supreme Court decided the Shelby County case that cut the heart out of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Mm -hmm. Santa was angry about what the court did. And then decided that anger is a useless emotion. She would do something affirmative, something positive. So she created this tumbler that starts with my descent in the Shelby County case. And then she thought about what's a proper name. Someone suggested a fellow Brooklynite, the notorious B.I.G. <laughs> People didn't know that we had that very important thing in common, that we were <laughs> both born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. And it's just taken off from there. I mean, it's amazing to me. In March, I will be 85. And everyone wants to take my picture. So Kate McKinnon plays you on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Felicity Jones is starring as you in a new feature film. A documentary oh. just debuted last, uh, last week at Sundance. How does it feel to see yourself on the screen? 
And I've seen the documentary, it's really good. It's really good. Uh, <laughs> and Kathleen Paradis, who introduced me, is in it. My personal trainer is in it. Uh, the, the filmmakers spent an hour in the gym with the two of us, and maybe two, three minutes of it shows up in the, in the film. The, um, the one with Felicity Jones, and I should give e equal billing to the person who plays Marty. Marty is um, Army Hammer. Uh -huh. and it, so, so somebody, I, I come and said, well, he's taller than Marty. And I said, and do you think you're the same height as Felicity Jones? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, th that film is called On the Basis of Sex, mm -hmm. and it will be out probably at the end of 2018. The script was written by my nephew, uh, the son of Marty's sister, and he based it on a case that Marty and I had uh, argued together. It, it, it's a case that didn't go to the Supreme Court, and I asked Daniel, my nephew, why he had picked that case, and he said because he wanted this film to be as much about a marriage as it was about the legal case. And the case is uh, very good. It, it's Charles E. Morris versus the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. This was a man who took good care of his mother, though she was 93. Uh, the Internal Revenue Code had a deduction, if you hired someone to be a substitute for yourself, to take care of a child, an elderly parent, an infirm relative of any age, the deduction was available to any woman or to a widowed or divorced man. Charles E. Morris had never married. He took the deduction, it was disallowed. He, he filed his own case in the tax court. He filed his own brief, which was the soul of simplicity. It said, if I were a dutiful daughter, I would have gotten this deduction. I'm a dutiful son. Mm. What sense does this make? I think the tax court judge said something to the effect of, we glean the taxpayer is making a constitutional argument. <laughs> but everyone knows that the Internal Revenue Code is immune from constitutional attack. It's riddled with arbitrary lines. Anyway, we took um, Charles E. Morris's case to the Tenth Circuit and argued it together in Denver. The Tenth Circuit decided that case in our favor. Congress changed the law prospectively. That was the interplay between the court and the legislature. The court said this gender line is no good and the legislature fixed it. Nevertheless, the Solicitor General asked the Supreme Court to review the decision and explain that even though this gender line was over, the Tenth Circuit's decision cast a cloud of unconstitutionality hmm. over dozens of federal statutes. See Appendix E. Appendix E was a list of every provision in the U.S. Code that differentiated on the basis of gender. Wow. It came from the Department of Defense computer. These were the days when no one had a personal computer. Um, but it was a, a bonanza. There it was, all the provisions that needed to be changed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, the case that is the center of, on the basis of sex, is the name of the film. So many democratic norms um, seem to be under assault now, uh, undermined the media, the judiciary. I'm just wondering if you think there is a moment when justices should respond. The judiciary is a reactive 
branch of government. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't generate the controversies that come before it. It has no agenda. It's reactive to what's out there. A very fine federal judge, Judge Goldberg from the Fifth Circuit once said, the courts don't make the conflagrations, but they do their best to put them out. Mm -hmm. If people ask me about an opinion, I, all I can say is read it. Uh, judges do depend on the bar to explain the importance of an independent judiciary. It is our nation's hallmark and pride, the federal judiciary. Is there any decisions that you regret? I can answer that question by telling you the advice I was given when I was a brand new judge on the DC circuit mm -hmm. by my senior colleague, Ed Tam. He said, Ruth, you're going to work hard on every case, every opinion that you write, but when it's released, when it's over and done, don't look back. Don't waste your time worrying about what's done. Go on to the next case and give it your all. Mm -hmm. And that is wonderful advice for for a judge. And, and were you able to follow that? And w without any difficulty, yes. Wow. <laughs> I am really impressed. And my, my, I must say I haven't had the kind of uh, challenge that some of my colleagues had when asked about Bush v. Gore. So Justice Scalia's answer to people who asked him, he said, say, get over it. <laughs> So over the years, there's been a suggestion that the lifetime tenure of Supreme Court justices be replaced by a set term that might, say, span several presidencies. Uh, it might reduce partisan anxiety. It could mean that older judges could be selected to serve. It could be a graceful way for judges, perhaps past their prime, to leave the bench. And I'm just wondering what you think about this idea. It is a subject on which I am biased and prejudiced. <laughs> and and I, I will admit that most countries in the world have a compulsory retirement age. Most mm -hmm. of our states have a compulsory retirement age for judges. Some ha have a fixed term, fixed non-renewable term. But I'm grateful to the Founding Fathers for writing into the Constitution that the judges shall hold their office during good behavior. <laughs> so I, I'm, many people have asked me, oh, well, when, when are you going to step down? So my, my, my first response uh, was, I had a, a painting on loan from the Museum of American Art. It was by Joseph Albers and I loved it. And they took it away from me for a traveling show. About eight years later, it came back. And so I said, I couldn't even begin to think about leaving until I get my Albers back. <laughs> And it came back. The next was Brandeis. He was the same age as I was when he was appointed. And he stepped down after 23 years. That worked for years 20 to 23, but now I'm, I'm no longer sitting Jewish justice, more than Brandeis, more than Frankfurter. So I can't use that Brandeis anymore. So I'm just candid and say, as long as I can do the job full steam, I will be here. Well, 
we are sadly almost out of time. Um, there is one question that I must ask you. If I can take a personal privilege here, it's a question that I had the privilege of asking President Obama and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Susan Rice when she was National Security Advisor. What is your favorite flavor of bagel? Oh. <laughs> uh, you know. A New York poppy seed bagel. Oh my gosh! I did not know, this is amazing, I did not know the answer to this. And this may be the only thing that Barack Obama and Benjamin Netanyahu and Ruth Bader Ginsburg agree on. They all, <laughs> they all pick poppy seed. Wow, I am amazed. So I, I, of all the many questions and notes from readers that we received, one stands out, and I'd like to uh, quote from this in our closing. It comes from Carly Ray Brown of Evansville, Indiana. And Carly, I hope that you are watching. She is nine years old in the fourth grade. And she says that she is your biggest fan. Her Girl Scout troop marched in a Christmas parade, and they were asked to uh, hold up signs about what they wanted to be when they grew up. And her sign said, Supreme Court Justice. And she wants to be a justice, she says, to support women's rights and other people who aren't treated fairly. She also, are you ready, wants to be called CRB, <laughs> like you. And here's her question. She said, what can I do now as a nine-year-old to make a change? How can I follow in your footsteps? May I say first that the idea of, of a young girl aspiring to be a judge, even more Supreme Court justice, is a wonderful thing. And I have a granddaughter who is now a lawyer. When she was eight, I was being filmed for some show, and, and my granddaughter Clara was with me. And she said that she wanted to be in the film, too. So the filmmaker said, all right, Clara, we'll ask you a question. What would you like to be when you grow up? And this then eight-year-old said, I would like to be president of the United States of the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's a difference between the aspirations uh, that young women can have today mm -hmm. and what they had in the not so good old days. Well, I think she should um, take her schoolwork very seriously, become a good reader. Uh, reading is tremendously important in the job I now, I now hold. And then do things in your community. I'm sure that you will find things, um, whether it's assisting in getting food to the homeless people, or if you care about the environment, helping keep your local parks clean. Um, many things that you can do to make things a little better in, in your community. So that is what I would, would advise her to do. Well, she asked me to ask you to please stay on the Supreme Court until she can take your spot. <laughs> uh, somehow I think there are people in this room who might agree. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you all. This has just been an amazing evening. Uh, personal thanks to my dear friend and wonderful supporter Kathleen Paradis for the lovely introduction and for all that you did to make this happen, to Rabbis Holtzblatt and Rabbi Alexander, as well as David Polanski and Courtney Tisch and all the people at Addis Israel. You guys are amazing. It was such a pleasure to work with you.
I'd, I'd like to recognize the Forwards Board Chair, Jake Morowitz, and our President, Sam Norwich, and the rest of the Forwards National Board, many of whom flew in here to Washington to be here tonight, to Forward readers and supporters. Without your generous support, we couldn't do what we can do. And for all of you who came here tonight, and all of those who are watching on webcast and Facebook, online, thank you so much for being part of this wonderful conversation. And of course, our greatest thanks to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you, thank you very much. until the justice has exited the building uh, and the security personnel will then open the doors behind you. This is a perfect time to talk about all the amazing things that we learned tonight. So thank you so much.